we call it a new form of evil in the, on the world. It's never been done by any government in the past to take a large group of its own people and say we're going to uh, kill you without any kind of a trial uh, and we're going to sell your vital organ parts. An individual from the United States or Canada, for example, could anticipate undergoing transplantation on a specified date. It's a crime against humanity. It's, it's, it's abhorrent and it needs to stop. If you're going to go to China and you're going to get a liver transplant during the three weeks you are there, then that means someone is going to go schedule an execution, blood type and tissue type the potential executee, and have them ready to go before you need to leave. Starting at the end of 1999, the number of transplants taking place just exploded. China carries out more organ transplant surgeries than any country besides the United States. But unlike other countries, China has no effective organ donation program. That's because culturally, Chinese people believe the body must stay intact even after death. China's Deputy Minister of Health, Huang Jiefu, has suggested that there are 7,000 transplants every year from the deceased, and that more than 90% come from executed prisoners. The number of criminal executions in China is classified as a state secret but Amnesty International's estimate is about 1,700. The numbers just didn't add up. It's just too large of a discrepancy there. With only 1,700 executed criminals and no effective donation system, where do the rest of the organs come from? <laughs> Zhao Xu Huan was put in a Chinese labor camp because she practices Falun Gong. We estimate that in the period between 2000 and 2005, there are 41,500 transplants which have no other explained source. I am absolutely convinced that over a long period from 1999 onwards, uh, organ harvesting from prisoners has been taking place, especially with Falun Gong. Doctors would come into the camps, they would look in their eyes, they would examine their organs with ultrasound and the like. And they were the only people in these camps who were, who were medically examined thoroughly. In 2006, two Canadians, international human rights lawyer David Matus and former Secretary of State for Asia Pacific David Kilgore, started to investigate allegations of forced organ harvesting in China. They found at least 52 points of circumstantial evidence, including websites of Chinese hospitals offering matching organs in less than a week. It, it's just not possible unless you have an unlimited source of organs. And these are people who are alive. We're talking about live donors. The actual transplant surgery itself was the form of execution. These were living people that were killed for their organs. It makes you think of some grotesque restaurant where you go in and you pick your lobster in a tank. But these are human beings we're talking about. The, the military's making money off of it. The hospitals are making money off of it. The middlemen are making money off of it. And we talk about money. We're talking about a multi-million dollar operation. Journalist and author Ethan Gutman decided to carry out his own independent investigation. We had uh, witnesses of disappearances, uh, people who'd been examined and then had disappeared, bus loads entire prison wards which had been emptied out. Uh, the signs w began to look like something much, much bigger. Like Tibetans and house Christians, 
millions of Falun Gong practitioners are being persecuted in China for their beliefs. In 1999, Communist Party leader Jiang Zemin issued orders to break them financially, ruin their reputations, and destroy them physically. Since then, thousands of Falun Gong practitioners have disappeared without a trace. What happened to the disappeared? Uh, they, 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 as far as we're, we know, they're still there in these camps. Uh, many of them have been killed through organ harvesting, but the rest are still there, and they're the organ data bank for China. Around 1999, there were around 150 transplant centers. Six, seven years later, they had 600 transplantation centers. This is a, an increase by 300% within such a short period of time without an organ donation program. Military hospitals get watched in China, okay? There is nothing they can do uh, without the party central taking note of what they're doing. Was this run by triads? No. This is run by the state. This was murder, and it came from the state. This is a crime against humanity. We should do our best to identify those specific individuals who are engaged in this and put them on the list of people who deserve to be brought to justice. In 2006, when this came out and we realized that they were killing prisoners of conscience for their organs, it was doctors that took the front line in trying to stop this. Every day there are a dozen of people that are executed or killed for organs in China. So we, we have to bring out the message, we have to inform medical doctors to stop this practice. But it's not only the medical community that's getting informed. The U.S. State Department mentioned allegations of forced organ harvesting in its annual Human Rights Report on China in 2011 for the first time. On October 3rd, 106 U.S. congressional representatives signed this bipartisan Dear Colleague letter to the State Department, demanding they reveal information on organ harvesting that they may have obtained from their sources in China. This barbaric human rights abuse must be stopped, but to stop it, we first have to further expose it. And with even more petitions circulating online, the issue is starting to get worldwide attention. But more needs to be done. In años recientes, más chinos se han trasladado al exterior en busca de una vida mejor. Pero a partir de julio del año próximo, quienes deseen trasladarse de nuevo a China no pueden solo empacar sus valijas y partir. Legisladores chinos han introducido nuevas leyes de inmigración exigiendo a los ciudadanos la solicitud de aprobación antes de poder regresar a su patria. La nueva ley para el control de salidas y entradas de ciudadanos fue aprobada en junio. Los ciudadanos chinos que deseen establecerse de regreso en China tendrán que solicitar primero la aprobación antes los consulados chinos. Alternativamente, sus familias en China pueden hacer la solicitud en sus localidades. Los chinos en el extranjero están preocupados puesto que la nueva ley les impone restricciones injustas. Joan Hui, abogado chino en el continente, dice que las leyes son fuera de lo común. Cuando usted no tiene la nacionalidad de otro país y aún es ciudadano chino, es muy común que el gobierno le restrinja las entradas y salidas de esta manera. Es como si le estuvieran diciendo, si usted se va, no regrese. Eso es irracional. Es como una reacción infantil y ridícula. Hay quienes creen que las nuevas medidas podrían ser una manera para que el régimen chino mantenga alejado a un cierto conjunto de ciudadanos. Muchos ciudadanos chinos, por ejemplo activistas democráticos en el exilio, insisten en mantener sus pasaportes chinos y no optan por la nacionalidad norteamericana. Ahora el régimen está impidiendo a estas personas el regreso a su hogar. Siento que es una maniobra política y puede ser parte de sus medidas para mantener la estabilidad. La nueva ley es similar a las normas ya existentes para regular la entrada y la salida de ciudadanos chinos pero antes solo formaban parte de las reglas adicionales a las leyes ya existentes. Ahora esas reglas han sido formalizadas efectivamente y codificadas como leyes. 